I'm John Seabrook. This is Will's laptop. He told me not to push any buttons. But what's this one do? No. Um, at any rate, I'm going to uh, introduce Will, and then you're in for a treat. Will's going to uh, uh, play a short demo of his new game, Spore. And then I'll come back, and we're going to have um, a little discussion. But first, I wanted to explain very briefly and very quickly why what you are about to see is so exciting and so interesting to so many people and why you too should be aware of this new game even if you, like me, fall on the wrong side of the great generational divide of our time, which is the divide between gamers and non-gamers. Will is a maker of simulation games. His games have no clear goals, no simple outcomes, few rules, no antagonists, hardly any violence, and no obvious way to win. Doesn't sound like much fun. And yet Will is, on top of being the greatest visionary in game design today, also one of the most successful game makers at work. Will's games seek to reproduce real-life dynamic processes. In SimCity, Will's first blockbuster, which first appeared in 1989, the player is in charge of managing hundreds of variables in a fictional city. He or she for unlike most game designers, Will's games appeal to women equally as, as well as men, um, must manage the city's finances, choose wisely to invest in roads, hospitals, schools, in such a way that allows the city to grow. The game has not only been immensely successful commercially, it has probably influenced more young people to become urban designers than any other single work. For his next blockbuster game, The Sims, Will decided to simulate the dynamics of a family. In The Sims, the player is in charge of getting his Sims good educations, jobs, building their houses, finding the mates, friends, and all the many other things that go into leading a happy and fulfilling life. In short, The Sims is a simulation of ordinary, everyday life, which is a far more difficult thing to pull off than making a game about killing zombies or aliens. The Sims, which appeared in 2000, is now the best-selling PC game in history, and its various updates continue to sell well every year. At this point, most designers would have been content to rest on their laurels, but instead, Will challenged himself to come up with a far more ambitious simulation than the impossibly ambitious Sims, namely an algorithmic reproduction of Darwinian evolution. In Spore, you begin as a single-celled organism in a tide pool-like environment. With each new generation, you accumulate DNA points, which you can spend on one, or another, on one or another part of your being. You can choose to develop a bigger brain, faster limbs, or more powerful claws. You can play a conciliatory game of making peace with your neighbors, or you can play a warlike game of conquest. If you make the right choices, according to the logic of the simulation, you will continue to evolve. Eventually, you form tribes, acquire technology, build cities, and acquire the means to travel to other planets in the universe of the game, which will be populated by creatures other players have created and continue to evolve with them. In short, the game is endless. Spore is Sim Everything, which is in fact an, was an early title of the game. Breathtaking both in the simplicity of the concept and in the complexity of the execution, Spore is a simulation of the rules of life itself, and it is, easily, it is easy to imagine the community of Spore developing into an entire parallel universe, a new world. But while we're not sure who in this world wrote the rules, in Spore we do know who the god of the universe is, and we're very lucky to have that god here with us today. So please welcome Will Wright. Hello, everyone. Uh, as John kind of alluded to, you know, games in some sense are like the black sheep of kind of the mass media landscape out there. And I think there are a couple reasons for that. Number one is generational. You know, there's definitely this kind of generational divide between people who grew up with games and continue to play them and the people that don't. And I think like with The New Yorker, there's probably not a huge overlap with the readership of The New Yorker and the people that play games right now, although it is significant, I think. But I think in about five years, it is going to be a significant overlap. I mean, a huge overlap. You know, surprisingly, our average player right now is 25 years old. 